Okay, so. Yeah, like, uh, welcome everybody. Welcome to this lecture in macroeconomics. Uh, today on the agenda is uh, chapter seven, the ASAD model. And uh, I would like to start once more with like a few comments. Like when we talk about the ASAD model, then the macroeconomic setting in the initial equilibrium is completely different from the ISLM world. So uh, in case that we are in this initial equilibrium at the level of uh, 2000, then it is a case that there is no big unemployment problem. Like the economy is running at 100%, like we are utilizing all our capital units, like in the bakery, all the 100 ovens which are standing around are heated up and like the complete labor force is working. Uh, we don't have huge unemployment rates. This is the setting in the ASAD world. And it's completely different from the ISLM world in chapter five, where we assume that the initial, in the initial situation, um, uh, we have a very severe recession. We are in a Keynesian depression and the unemployment rates are 25%. Uh, only 75% of the labor forces uh, ha has a job and uh, only 75% of the capital, which is in place, is, uh, is utilized. So the macroeconomic setting is completely different. Therefore, uh, when we talk about uh, this graph and, and this model, I think it's important to be precise. It's not the ISLM ASAD model, although you can see in the lower part of the diagram, IS and LM, so I would like to call it ASAD uh, in order to make this uh, yeah, difference clear that ISLM, this is chapter five, a very severe recession and ASAD, no unemployment problem in the initial situation. There is no unemployment problem because here um, uh, the unemployment rate is equal to the natural rate uh, GDP is at the natural level uh, and, and therefore it is uh, impossible in the end that the government or the central bank can increase this GDP level. So this is impossible because we are at the natural rate. So in case that this kind of demand shock occurs, like the central bank is increasing money supply or the government is increasing government spending, in the end, it will be the case that uh, the level of output does not change. In the new medium run equilibrium, the level of output will be the same. Um, yeah, so like you are or you were exposed already uh, to um, the model structure um, because we were um, introducing the model uh, in these uh, YouTube videos. And now we would like to start to discuss some shocks. And the first shock uh, we are going to talk about is an expansionary monetary policy in the ASAD model. Uh, you can directly see the three endogenous variables. Uh, the uh, GDP level Y is endogenous, the interest rate is endogenous and the price level is endogenous so that we can explain now changes in the goods price and therefore we can explain the phenomenon of inflation. Uh, that's also a new element in chapter seven that uh, we can talk about this third very important macroeconomic variable like inflation. Um, yeah, so um, let's, uh, let's uh, get started. Uh, expansionary monetary policy implies uh, that the central bank is increasing money supply. And therefore we know that in the lower part of the diagram, uh, the LM curve will shift to the right. Uh, the LM curve uh, shifts to the right. And therefore in a first step, uh, we can observe in the lower part of the diagram, 
that the demand increases by 250 units. In the lower part of the diagram, we have now the demand side of the economy, like we used this ISLM graph in order to derive the aggregate demand curve. And hence in the lower part, uh, we have the demand for goods, the demand side. And demand increases by the distance AB, demand increases by 250 units. This has to be incorporated in the upper part of the diagram. Uh, we have to find the distance AB in the upper part of the diagram. And uh, the AD curve shifts by 250 units to the right. So uh, in the upper part of the diagram, PA is equal to PB. Uh, PA equal to PB, we have a horizontal shift of the AD curve to the right. In the upper part of the diagram, uh, we have to find the new intersection between the AS curve and the AD curve. And this is point number C. Point C is a short run equilibrium. And it is the case that the goods prices already increase in the short run. So goods prices now are flexible. Uh, goods prices increase, goods prices increase in the medium run to the level C. And when um, the um, goods prices increase, this has a feedback effect on real money supply. Uh, we have a real money supply defined as M over P. And when the prices increase, then real money supply decreases. And therefore, the LM curve shifts a little bit back uh, to the left. So now uh, on slide number six, uh, you can see uh, the equilibrium in the short run, which is point number C. Uh, so we can sum up the effects. An expansionary monetary policy in the short run uh, increases GDP. It decreases the interest rate and it increases the goods price. These are the effect in the ASAD world. Uh, we can already compare, if you want to, uh, the effects in the ASAD world in the short run compared to the ISLM world. In the ISLM world, where the goods prices are constant, income would increase by 250 units income would increase from 2000 to 2250. But here in the ASAD world, uh, goods prices increase. And therefore, it is the case that real money supply expansion is not as uh, large as in the ISLM world. And the income effect is limited. There is a positive effect. But the multiplier is definitely smaller compared to the ISLM world. Now um, we have to think about what happens in the uh, time period between the short run and the long run. The prices increased from PA to PC, but the price expectations are right now still on the level of PA. Like when the uh, labor unions and the employer associations uh, performed their wage negotiations, it is the case that uh, both parties believed that the goods prices will be on the level PA. But now the goods price is on the level PC, so the goods price is higher. The goods price is higher, and this implies for the real wage that the real wage is lower. Uh, when the real wage is lower, of course, the companies have an incentive to hire more people. Employment is higher and therefore in situation C, also GDP is higher. But of course, the labor unions and the workers, uh, they are to some, some extent dissatisfied because they don't want to work for this real wage because it's lower. So when the next wage negotiations will take place, uh, price expectations will be adjusted, will be adjusted upwards, 
And when the price expectations increase, uh, the AS curve shifts upwards. Um, there is a new pink AS curve in the upper part of the diagram. Uh, the AS curve shifts upwards and therefore we get a new equilibrium in the medium run in point number D. Um, because of the fact that prices increase from the level PC to the level PD, uh, the LM curve shifts once more uh, to the left. So the green LM2 curve shifts to the left and the pink LM3 curve is valid. So that in the end, an expansionary monetary policy is digested in the following way. Uh, GDP is constant. Uh, GDP does not change. Uh, YA is equal to YD. Also, the interest rate is constant. Uh, IA is equal to ID. And uh, the price level increased from PA to PD. So in the end, an expansionary monetary policy just led to an increase in the goods prices. So an expansionary monetary policy in the medium run only leads to inflation. Um, real money supply, so M over P is constant. When money supply increased by 10%, then also the goods prices increase by 10%. So that real money supply is constant. Uh, this is like the end of the graphical analysis. What follows are like the dynam dynamics. So how do we get from A to B, from B to C, from C to D? Like these different steps. But perhaps I'll switch to the uh, plenum um, and check whether there is a question. Any questions? Great. So then let's proceed with the dynamics um, from A to B. Uh, we start with an increase in money supply. Money supply is larger than money demand. So the central bank is flying helicopter money. The private household um, opens the door of uh, his house. He finds some money and this private household is in a disequilibrium. Money supply is suddenly larger than money demand. Like this private household was pretty satisfied when he went to bed the night before, because when he went to bed, money supply was equal to money demand. Suddenly the central bank flew helicopter money. The household has too much money. What is the household doing? The household is not going shopping, no shopping. Because shopping, like consumption, consumption depends on the autonomous component of consumption plus uh, C1 mine, uh, times disposable income. There is no money in the consumption function and therefore no shopping. Uh, the private household is trying to get rid of the money by buying bonds. Bond demand increases. Bond demand is larger than bond supply. The bond prices increase, the interest rate decreases, and then money demand increases because of the fact that the opportunity cost of holding money decrease. Then we have a spillover effect from the money market to the goods market. Uh, investment picks up, demand for investment goods increases, demand is larger than supply, and the companies are adjusting um, production, output increases, and the income generated in the production process increases. But we have to be careful here because also like in this step, it will be the case that the goods prices increase. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. First, let's proceed what's going on on the goods market. So a positive multiplier effect occurs, uh, GDP is up. And then we have once more, this is spillover effect from the goods market to the money market, money demand increases. So this is the traditional um, 
uh, argumentation in the ISLM world, like in the lower part of the diagram, with one exception, that now also the prices increase in uh, the short run. And we will look at the effects of this price increase on the next slide. So the price, goods prices increase. When goods prices increase, a real money supply decreases. Therefore, money demand is larger than money supply. Our bond supply increases because the people try to get like more money. Bond supply larger than bond demand. Bond prices decrease, interest rate up, and money demand decreases. So from B to C, when we look in the graph, uh, from B uh, to C, the interest rate increases again. So this is in line with the graphical solution. Then we have a spillover effect from the money market to the goods market. Uh, investment is affected in a negative way. Goods demand is uh, affected in a negative way. Goods supply is larger than goods demand. And GDP decreases again. From B to C, our GDP decreases. And therefore, the effect on GDP is lower in the short run equilibrium of the ASAD model like compared to the ISLM model. Um, like when we now uh, look at the two effects, like here I said GDP is up by three arrows from A to B, and here GDP is down by one arrow. There is still a positive net effect on GDP in the short run. So GDP is up by two arrows. And this is what we see in this graph on slide number six. In the short run equilibrium, uh, GDP is up. Like from A to B, I said this is three arrows and then GDP decreases again by one arrow. So there is still a positive net effect on GDP. Um, so now in the dynamic adjustment process, we are in the short run equilibrium C. What happens from C uh, to D? Uh, from C to D, we have to check what is going on on the labor market. What's going on with the real wage? Let's assume that in equilibrium A, the real wage was equal to nominal wage, equal to 2,000 euros. Uh, the price of a chocolate bar in A was equal to two euros per chocolate bar. So the real wage is equal to 1,000 chocolate bars. So the worker would like to get 1,000 chocolate bars in order to survive in one month. And uh, this is the real wage. But then uh, we learn that in equilibrium C, uh, the price has increased uh, from PA to PC. And in this numerical example, I'm assuming that uh, like the prices increased from two to three. And therefore, uh, the real wage is down. The nominal wage, uh, this is what I'm assuming here, like the nominal wage is fixed. We have some kind of wage rigidity and uh, we do not negotiate the nominal wage W like every week yeah we don't do that wage negotiations take place every two years therefore uh, the wage rate wa cannot be adjusted so right now the real wage is 667 bars of chocolate and uh, hence uh, labor is relatively cheap and the companies are hiring a lot of labor uh, but of course, uh, the labor unions and the workers are dissatisfied because uh, the workers are working for a relatively low real wage. When wage negotiations take place, the idea is, of course, hey, let's increase the nominal wage to the level of 3,000 euros. So the idea is to adjust the nominal wage and to adjust the price expectations. So here the price expectations are adjusted from two euros per chocolate bar uh, to three euros per chocolate bar. 
And the idea is that now the workers, they are earning like 1000 chocolate bars. But when the nominal wage increases, this leads to some cross pressure on the sides of the companies. Um, the costs uh, increase and therefore the companies will once more start uh, to increase the goods prices. Uh, we know that when the price expectations are adjusted, the aggregate supply curve shifts upwards and the goods prices increase once more. So maybe it will be the case that in the next time period, um, I call it P, P bar C or PC bar, uh, the goods prices increased even more to 350 euro per chocolate bar. Uh, the nominal wage is now at the level of 3000. So the real wage is equal to 857 chocolate bars. The real wage in this situation here is higher compared to the situation after the shock, but it's still lower compared to the equilibrium real wage. So this uh, wage negotiations will take place several times. And in the end, in the new equilibrium D, uh, real wage um, is once more equal to 1000 chocolate bars. The nominal wage is at the level of 4000 euros and the price level is at the level of four uh, euros per chocolate bar. So in the end, the real wage is constant. Real wage has not changed. And uh, the only thing which has, or the, the only macroeconomic variables which have changed is the goods price has increased. Uh, goods price is up by like 100%. And also the nominal wage is up by 100%. So we can conclude here that monetary policy in the ASAD world in the medium run only leads to inflation. It leads to goods price inflation and wage inflation. And therefore, like one recommendation could be, uh, hey, central bank, don't do it. Uh, don't uh, perform an expansionary monetary policy in the ASAD world because it only leads to inflation. Um, yeah, like this, um, Result can be summarized under the labels neutral, neutrality of money or classical dichotomy. What does it imply? Like no, neutrality implies an increase in money supply does not affect in the medium run the real output or the real interest rate. It has no effect on output. It has no effect on the interest rate it has no effect on the real wage rate. The real wage rate is also constant. The increase in money supply is neutralized via an increase in the price level. So nominal money supply increases, the price level increases. Let's uh, increase both macroeconomic variables by 10%. And then real money supply will be constant. This uh, is the label like neutrality of money, classical dichotomy. Uh, the supply side determines the level of the real income and the demand side determines the level of the price level or the size of the price level. The demand side determines the size of the nominal wage rate, but the supply side determines the level of the real wage. Let's have a look at the empirical analysis. Here um, we have a kind of simu simulation. I think it was related to the US and it was simulated based on real data, how the prices increase and the output behaves in the US in case that the central bank increases or performs an expansionary monetary policy. It is the case that in the short run, like after like one year after the shock occurred, not too much is going on with the prices. So the prices are pretty constant in the first year. 
um, we see small increases, but not too much. So it takes time until the price increases. But we directly see a big peak here in output. Output increases in the first year, reaches its peak after one year, and then the effect on output decreases again. Like after uh, five to seven years, uh, we have no effect on output anymore. So uh, output is on the same level as before. So we only have a temporary effect on output. And uh, this effect diminishes over time. After five to seven years, this shock is digested. Also, with respect to the prices, uh, this shock is digested in the medium run. Like after like five to seven years, uh, prices do not increase anymore, but this uh, price curve levels off. Uh, prices increase and prices stay on a higher level, which is completely in line with our discussion in the ASAD world. So, like this is the empirical evidence related to the ACE AD world. Uh, seems to be like a relatively good model in case that we want to have a forecast uh, with respect to what is going on in the short run and what's going on in the medium run. Uh, we never talk about the long run, uh, not in this course, like long run we would look at a completely different model class. It's also included in the Blanchard textbook, like chapter 10, 11, 12, or something like that. But we will not talk about the long run, long run models uh, in this course. I think that I have talked uh, a lot and I would like to give you the time to digest and I would like to split you up and you can uh, talk in smaller study groups, groups um, about this lecture. Um, I'll give you four or five minutes in uh, uh, smaller group sessions with three to four participants. Please accept the invitations and check whether the one or the other student has a question or whether everybody has understood everything. See you in a few minutes. Yeah, so welcome back to class. Uh, I would like to know whether there are some questions. So you can uh, use the chat if you want to, or you can raise your voice. Um, yes, I have a question. Victor, those kids. Um, will there be exercises this week? Because there wasn't anything uploaded so far. Oh, okay. Uh, we will have uh, exercise classes, like exercise videos, and also like a kind of e-learning tool, I guess. Uh, but uh, we will upload it after this lecture here, uh, because uh, you, you will need like also this uh, shock analysis, dynamic analysis, when you want to understand the exercise class. Therefore, we are uploading this stuff like after this lecture today. So we still have some time because uh, like after we are done with uh, this lecture today, uh, we have covered all chapters and uh, we still have uh, some meetings next week. So we are in a good time. Okay, thank you. Other questions? 
Okay. Then let's proceed and uh, talk about a restrictive fiscal policy in the ASAD world. Um, yeah, why a restrictive fiscal policy? What could be like the idea of a government uh, which is uh, implementing a restrictive fiscal policy? Uh, it could be the case that the government budget is in red ink. So the government is running a government budget deficit and therefore the government would like to decrease government spending or the government would like to increase taxes. For example, the Greek government, the government of Greece, was forced to implement this kind of uh, policy uh, because, of, because of the fact that uh, uh, the Greek government budget was in red ink. Uh, the ECB, IMF, uh, European Commission, they stepped by in form of the so-called Troika. And they uh, said uh, to the Greek government, hey, like you have to decrease government spending. You have to cut pensions. You have to cut wages of the teachers, for example. And you have to increase taxes. So uh, afterwards, um, um, it will be the case that the economy will end up in a recession, of course, uh, because of this restrictive fiscal policy. And now uh, we would like to discuss uh, this kind of shock in the ASAD model and check how the shock is digested in the medium run and how the shock is digested in the, uh, how the shock is digested first in the short run and then in the medium run. So starting point is point number A. Like we have here this uh, blue AS curve and this orange AD curve, this is the starting point, point number A. In the lower part of the diagram, it's also point number A, like the uh, gray uh, IS curve and this uh, pink LM curve. So this is the initial equilibrium, uh, point number A. Uh, the government implements a restrictive fiscal policy. So the um, uh, IS curve shifts uh, to the left and uh, point B uh, would be the equilibrium in the ISLM world. But here in chapter seven, uh, it just symbolizes that the demand decreases from the level A to the level B. And this implies that in the upper part of the diagram, uh, the AD curve shifts to the left. And then we have to look for the new intersection of the new AD prime curve and the AS curve, which is here in point A prime. This is a new short run equilibrium. So prices already decrease in the short run from P uh, to P prime. This has to be considered in the lower part of the diagram. So the LM curve shifts to the right or down because of the fact that the goods prices decrease from P to P prime. Therefore, in the lower part of the diagram, the short run equilibrium is also symbolized by the point A prime. Like in the short run, uh, the economy um, has a lower interest rate in place and the economy ends up in a recession. So this restrictive fiscal policy is causing a recession in Greece. Now we have to consider in the upper part of the diagram that the goods prices decreased from A to A prime. Goods prices decreased, but the nominal wage is still on a high level, no wage negotiations have taken place. But the next time when wage negotiations take place, uh, the price expectations can be adjusted, can be adjusted to the lower level and nominal wages have to decrease. In case that these price expectations are adjusted, 
adjusted downwards, V AS curve shifts downwards and the AS uh, double prime curve becomes valid. So this uh, first AS curve shifts downwards because the price expectations are adjusted. Uh, the AS double prime curve becomes valid and the GDP level in the initial equilibrium and in the medium run is the same. Uh, goods prices have decreased, so the economy went through a phase of deflation. So during the whole adjustment process, it was the case that the goods prices decreased. Oh. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, the lower part of the diagram. Also here, A and A prime, the GDP level is the same. Like in the new uh, medium run equilibrium, the GDP level is the same as in the initial situation. However, during the adjustment process, the economy was running through a phase of recession. A GDP was lower in the adjustment process. Uh, the interest rate uh, decreased from the level IA uh, to the level IA double prime. This is the graphical analysis of a restrictive fiscal policy. On the next slide, I would like to highlight what is going on um, in the adjustment process, like from C to D, what's going on on the labor market. Um, like, let's assume that in equilibrium A, the real wage was equal to 1,000 chocolate bars, the nominal wage was equal to 4,000 euros, and the price was equal to 4 euros per chocolate bar. This is the initial setting. And now, in the new short-run equilibrium, perhaps you have to make a note here I'm not fully in line with uh, the previous slide. My God, wait a second, I have to talk to my wife. Yeah, I think I'm in the Vorlesung. I don't know what with is. and I'm with when you with Kaeli. Very good. Yeah. Back on track. So, like, there is a slight inconsistency uh, between uh, this graph and my uh, explanations because in this graph in the textbook, uh, the short run equilibrium was labeled by A prime. So please make a short note here that A prime is equal to C. So I would like to talk about the short run equilibrium. So in the short run equilibrium, the prices already decreased from four to three, but the wage negotiations have not taken place. So the uh, nominal wage has not changed. When the goods prices decrease, this has an effect on the real wage. The real wage is higher than before. When the real wage is higher than before, then the companies will not demand as much labor as before. Uh, so that in uh, the uh, short run equilibrium, it will be the case that unemployment rate is higher. Unemployment is a problem and the economy is in a recession like with a lower number of workers employed, uh, output will decrease. So the real wage is too high. Then the idea could be, hey, let's decrease the nominal wage to the level of 3000 euros. The idea is that we adjust the nominal wage so that the real wage is once more equal to 1000 chocolate bars. But this will have a downward pressure once more on the goods prices. Goods prices uh, decrease once more when the price expectations are adjusted. And um, 
Uh, then the real wage is adjusted to the level of 1,200 chocolate bars. Uh, the disequilibrium is not as extreme as in the short run equilibrium. So we are on a way to a new equilibrium, but not there. So in D, uh, D uh, in this graph is uh, A double prime. So the new medium run equilibrium, A double prime is equal to D in my slides. In D, in the new short run equilibrium, uh, nominal wages have decreased to the level of 2000. Uh, prices have decreased uh, to the level of two and the new equilibrium real wage is equal to 1000 chocolate bars. So, um, when we are the economic advisors to Greece and we are implementing like a restrictive fiscal policy in the Greek economy. So um, we have to be a little bit concerned about the consequences because of the fact that uh, in the adjustment process, the economy will end up in a recession. So in the short run equilibrium, the economy will be in a recession. But of course, like the European Commission, IMF, and uh, um, the ECB, they knew these kind of effects. So like you learn it in Macroeconomics 101, like in your first macro class, you know that a restrictive fiscal policy uh, in the ACD world leads to a recession. But uh, the Troika, they always came up like with a, with a good message. They were pronouncing that, hey, like when you have digested the, the shock, then you are back on track. It will be the case that uh, GDP in the new medium run equilibrium will be the same. Now, the $100,000 question is, like when does the Greek economy arrive in the new medium run equilibrium? How long does this adjustment process take? This is a very important question. How long does it take? Somebody wants to uh, answer, give a good uh, guess here. Kai, what do you think? Give me a wrong very, answer. Very long very very long it will take very very long um like previously we we learned that in the us um the medium run is like five to seven years something like that but this empirical evidence was produced only for the us so how long does it take in greece um in the greek greek economy Let's check. It lasts so long as it lasts. Yeah. We have to check that these kind of adjustments have to take place in the Greek economy so that the economy can be back on track. So the economy has to go through a phase of recession, cut nominal wages by 50% and cut the prices by 50% and then the economy is back on track. What happens when you are trying to cut nominal wages in Greece by 50%? You'll get a civil war in the streets of Athens like the labor unions will protest and there will be a war, labor unions against police. And hence, this adjustment process is not done after five or seven years. Like right now, we are riding the year 2020. Like this big crisis occurred like 2008, 2009. So like more or less, that's 11, 12 years ago. And the Greek economy has not digested these kind of shocks because of the fact that nominal wages are not completely flexible downwards. You can, of course, adjust nominal wages relatively easily upwards. When you give every worker more money, everybody is satisfied. But it's very hard to implement 
uh, this kind of uh, reduction in the nominal wage uh, rates in Greece because of all these protests which will go on. So therefore, this adjustment process will lead, need more time in the Greek economy compared to uh, what we have seen before, like the empirical evidence with respect to the US. Um, let's proceed. Uh, the demand structure has changed uh, due to the consolidation of the government budget. Uh, let's draw a diagram. I think it's better to visualize uh, this slide. Let's say uh, this is our cake. This is uh, GDP in A. Uh, this is uh, consumption. Uh, uh, this is we're not seeing can't anything. see anything well yeah. okay uh, huh. teilen ansicht groß machen so like uh, we are in situation A, the initial equilibrium, and this is our GDP, and these are the pieces of the cake. 50% uh, goes to consumption, 25% uh, to government expenditure, and 25% to investment. In part D, uh, in the new medium run equilibrium, the size of the cake will be the same. Also, the piece of the cake which goes to consumption is the same in case that here the government only decreased government spending. Then it will be the case that the piece of the cake which goes to consumption will be the same. Like um, investment will get a larger piece of the cake because of the fact that like R, the interest rate, and no, I, the interest rate, has decreased and therefore investment increased. Government spending uh, decreased because the government performed a restrictionary fiscal policy. So here uh, we can once more see a situation where the level of GDP is the same. Uh, G the GDP level is constant, but the structure has changed. Uh, this is what is mentioned on uh, slide number 15. And now that you know what I want to talk about, uh, we can have a look at the slides once more. Uh, okay. <laughs> I can see the slides, but you can't. Now you can also see the slides. Uh, the demand structure has changed due to the con consideration of the government budget deficit. Uh, we assume that like taxes are unchanged, only government spending decreased, and therefore like uh, GDP is the same, also disposable income is the same. Consumption is on the same level as before. Government expenditure has decreased, so it has to be the key case that investment increased. And we can also see it in the graph, uh, the interest rate is lower than before, and therefore investment has increased. Uh, the increase in investment is equal to the decrease in government spending. So a fiscal consolidation of the government budget leads in the medium run to reduction of the interest rate level and an increase in the investment activity. And this could also be like a nice message to the Greek economy, hey, uh, in the medium run, like uh, investment will be higher than before because the government uh, makes uh, itself a little bit uh, smaller. Uh, this could also be like a good message. The only problem is, hey, what if uh, in the meantime, the economy ends up in the so-called investment trap? Uh, then uh, the Greek economy has a problem. 
but we can talk about uh, ASAD and investment trap also in the next week. So that's the second shock uh, we uh, talked about here. Um, what about like uh, this breakup? Is it valuable? Kai, can I get a quick indication whether you are Sometimes yes, sometimes no. It depends if you have questions or not. What do you think right now? Should we make a short break and you once more discuss with your classmates or should I proceed? I think we should fin uh, finish the slides and maybe then we can make a break. Okay, that's a good idea, like excellent idea. And uh, I will uh, uh, start with the next shock. It will also be the last shock. So uh, powered 7.6 uh, changes in the oil price. You can see here the oil price development over time. When you have no clue about uh, macroeconomics and you are in an oral exam and you get a time series, you can always talk about oil price shock one, oil price shock two, oil price shock three. So oil price shock one occurred here in the 73, 74. Oil price shock two uh, in the 80s, and then oil price shock number three, like right before uh, the great financial crisis, 2008-2009. Uh, oil price was also skyrocketing uh, before that crisis. So uh, we observe here like time periods where like the oil price is really exploding, like like here in the 80s like it's increasing from the level of 250 uh, to the level of 500. So oil price is doubling in a very short time period. Also here in the 70s, oil price is doubling. So um, we wanna know like how does this affect the ASAD world? And the big problem is that um, there is no oil price in our production function or oil price does not affect the cost structure directly because in our production function, we don't have oil. Like we only have in our production function, the factor labor, like the production function is so easy, Y equal to N, no labor in the production function. So how do we get uh, this shock analyzed? We could argue that uh, the markup increases because the university needs the markup in order to pay the oil bill. And hence, we can, we can model this uh, shock by increasing the markup. And in the first step, it makes sense to look uh, in the labor market model of chapter six, how the shock is digested. And here we can see that, uh, um, the price curve, a uh, price setting relationship shifts downwards uh, because when here this markup increases, markup increases, the fraction becomes smaller and the um, price setting relationship shifts down. Uh, what we can see uh, on the horizontal axis is that the unemployment rate increases so due to the fact that this uh, price shock occurred, this oil price shock occurred, it has a lasting effect on the unemployment rate. The natural rate of unemployment increases and hence uh, employment is down. When employment is down, good supply is down. We have a good supply shock here. So um, shock number one in this lecture was money supply shock but this occurs like on the demand side of the economy. Second shock in this lecture was uh, also a demand shock. The government performed a restrictive fiscal policy. And now the third shock is a supply shock, which occurs on the supply side of our economy. Let's analyze uh, what's going on. Um, we focus on the upper part of this diagram. Uh, a D curve is downward sloping, the AS curve is valid. So the initial equilibrium is point number A. 
uh, GDP is on the level YN and the prices are on the level A. When now the negative supply shock uh, occurs, like the oil price increases, then it will lead to a shift of the AS curve um, um, by the distance AB. And B is on the distance where the new, uh, like medium run natural rate of output is located. So we always said in our economy, we have like 100 professors in the labor force. In the initial situation, the natural rate of unemployment is 5%. So like 95% of the professors are working, 95% of the professors like 95 professors have an occupation at the universities and they are producing 95 lectures. But when now this oil price shock occurred uh, and uh, the markup increased and the new natural level of unemployment is at 10%, then only 90%, 90% of the labor force has a job, 90 professors have a job and 90 lectures are produced. So this YN is equal to 95, and this YN prime is equal to 90. The AS curve shifts uh, to the left, and then we find in the intersection of the AD curve and the AS curve, the new short run equilibrium. So already in the short run, we can see here a reduction in GDP. Uh, GDP decreases and the goods prices increase. Uh, goods prices increase and this will affect the price expectations in the medium run. Price expectations increase and therefore the AS curve shifts once more upwards until we reach a new equilibrium in the medium run in point number A prime. So the oil price shock is digested as follows. Uh, GDP is down also in the medium run. We are not going back on track, but GDP is lower. GDP is decreasing and the prices are increasing. When you want to make some labels uh, to these uh, shifts, the sh first shift occurs because mu is up, the markup increases. This is the oil price shock here. Then we have a second arrow upwards, the larger one. And this second arrow upwards is because of the price expectations increase. And when the price expectations increase, uh, the AS curve shifts upwards. So this is already the end of this lecture. Um, we have discussed uh, three different shocks, like sh two shocks which occur on the demand side of the economy and one shock which occurs on the supply side of the economy. In case that a shock takes place on the demand side, then in the medium run, the shock will be digested in the one or the other way, but the GDP level will be the same in the initial equilibrium and in the new medium run equilibrium. So uh, demand shocks, which occur on the demand side, they can be neutralized. But this is not the case with uh, supply shocks. Like supply shocks here, uh, they um, have a long lasting effect on GDP and negative uh, supply shocks lead uh, to a lower level of uh, output a lower level of employment, but a higher level of uh, the natural rate of unemployment. And now I'll stop this presentation and I'll also stop the Aufzeichnung here.